So like many sectors, agriculture has the potential to be transformed by the application of digital technologies. Some agricultural companies are already using technology to improve yields, manage land more sustainably and respond to market changes. But, but how can farmers in low and middle income countries really take advantage of this move? Well, to help shine a light on the opportunities and challenges posed by digital agriculture, I'm pleased to be joined today by Maximo Torero, who's the chief economist at the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations as part of our Tech for Tomorrow series hosted by DevEx and sponsored by KPMG. Maximo, uh, warm welcome. Oh, thank you very much and a pleasure to be here with you. Maximo, maybe we could begin just by framing this issue of, of digital agriculture for, for us and our audience and perhaps giving some examples of how digital technologies are currently used in farming practices. Sure. So digital technologies are has gone through an acceleration process, especially after COVID-19, but even before and mostly are being used to resolve market failures and information asymmetries. One of the ways you can use them is, for example, to do precision farming, where basically you can do soil maps over the night, upload information to crop models, go to the satellite information on weather and define how much fertilizer pesticides and seeds you need to put in, in a little piece of land uh, with your big tractor to try to, to optimize uh, yields. You can also use digital technologies for traceability, uh, like uh, blockchain technology, to be able to look at ledgers and trace the commodities that are being traded. You can use it for information systems, simple price information systems, so that you know where to sell in which market to sell. Uh, you can use it for early warning systems for farmers to use crop calendars to do extension services. So. The important thing to understand uh, is that digital technologies are a mean. What matters also is not only the mean that allows me to scale up because it's cost effective, but also the content of what I put into those digital technologies. That, that's the core element. Now, what is the, the challenge, and, and very quickly, uh, is that most of the evolution of digital technologies has focused a lot on large farms and has not been neutral to scale and not so much has focused on providing good quality services to smallholder farmers. And that's something that we need to, to stop. And so, so with these small holders in particular in mind in low and middle income country settings, um, what are some of the benefits that these things you mentioned could bring in terms of improving outcomes and really making sure that, that farming practices are sustainable? So the problem is uh, how you can uh, create uh, digital technologies to be scale neutral, meaning no matter the size, you can have access to it. What are the challenges? First is connectivity. So you need to have broadband at least uh, deployed, and that could be a public good, okay, uh, which will allow small farmers in, in, in poor areas of a country to be able to have access to this digital service. The second problem is the cost of access, you know, that's the affordability. The third one is if people know how to read and write to be able to understand that what comes through those digital technologies. And the last problem is quality of content. Okay, So we need to find ways in which uh, we can create those economies of scale. And that we believe is very important because if someone needs to do precision farming, meaning to use the resources and their inputs in the most efficient way, are the smallholders because they are the most budget constrained. Let me give you an example. Today, we know that significant amount of the fertilizers are being wasted. Why? Because governments provide packages, or private sector even, to farmers without having information on their soils. And the blending of the fertilizers is the difference between what the plant needs, what the soil has, and that's what you want to cover, of organic matter of N, P, and K. Now, if we are able to deploy soil maps at high resolution level, we can create that information and we can provide that information to the farmer so that he can plug in into an app what is the crop he's growing, his GPS location or her GPS location, and we can immediately provide them, this is the blending that you need so that they can go to the retailer and say, okay, this is the combination of MPK. That will increase efficiency, but that requires creating a public good of soil maps, digital soil maps that can be allowed to the system. So that's, those are the ways in which we can create this neutrality scale. Another example is how today, for example, we are sharing 
uh, capital intensive equipment like tractors, the Uber tractor or other ways of sharing the tractor. So a, a small farm needs a little time of the tractor. And if he can share with others, then it's affordable to them. So we need to find institutional innovations that will allow to create this neutrality to scale. And, and in these um, areas of, of pushing forward innovation and turning theory into practice, how is how is the FAO helping to support governments, industry, and even the small holder farmers themselves in these low income country settings? How, how can FAO help um, these small holders really benefit from, from technologies? Exactly. What, what FAO has started uh, two years ago is what we call the 1000 Digital Villages. And for us, that's a way in which we can bring uh, not only e-agriculture, but also e-services to farmers. And another dimension that we include in our villages, digital villages, is the community service so that we can create non-farm activities. Now, what is e-agriculture? E-agriculture is having soil maps, having crop calendars. So trying to get as close as possible to this support to them so that they can have a certain type of precision farming, okay? Of course, the goal is to keep improving because at the end of the line, if we are able to come up with very sophisticated crop models and, and very good data, if we can expand the level of digital soil maps that, that we are doing, we could end having a lot of what the large farmers have, but that's a process that we have started. So we supply farmers a series of apps that they can use for this type of services. They can get their crop calendar. Soon they will get the digital maps on, on, on soils. Uh, they can get also early warning systems. So things that could help them, but still we have not been able to integrate them. But that's one goal that we have. The e-services the e goes a little bit deeper in the sense that it tries to provide services at the village level, like for example, access to finance. So how we can create the scoring system through digital technologies where a farmer can enter certain parameters and get an scoring that will allow them to have more in financial inclusion. Just to give you an idea, the same applies for insurance tools. No? And then the last one, which is the community, the e-community, is more or less to, for example, developing ecotourism that will allow them to have a diversified income and not just focus on, on the crops and, and what they grow, but also that they can provide other services. So we are trying to bring all these packages. And our major focus is on the content and the quality of the content so that we provide good information to them and also on building capabilities. Like, for example, we are trying to work with icons to help them if they don't know how to read and write so that they can use the icons as a break of that barrier of of, uh, of not being able to, to, to read and write. So, yeah. but again, if the government is not there also to provide the access, then we could have a challenge because we can have the best apps of the world with the best content of the world, but these people cannot access to the level of, of, of internet that they need through broadband to be able to use this in the optimal way. Yeah, I was I was just going to ask, and maybe I can follow up on that. But the 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 di digital divide and the sort of lack of basic uh, literacy, as well as um, as online literacy, strikes me as as quite a challenge, as a, a barrier to overcome. Um, could you walk us through how that piece of the puzzle is is being tackled as well? So there, the digital divide is composed of the cost of access. That's one component, which is linked to availability so that you have accessibility to those type of, of services, but it's also composed of, of capabilities, no? And that's basically the skill set that you need to be able to optimize that. What we have found, so one way to do it, as I said, is okay, how we can provide tools that are easy to use and require the minimum skill set, like using videos for extension or using icons for them to select options through pot photographs. Like you can take a photograph of a disease, that photograph is uploaded to the system and then a response comes, which is graphical to explain them what to do. But the other tool that, the other mechanism that we have been looking very closely is what we called a upward intergenerational mobility. Basically not working directly with the farmer because he doesn't know how to read and write or, or he's too old, uh, which is what we are observing overall in the world, but working with their kids. So the youth behind uh, is a way to create the bridge between the technology and create that bridge that transform that knowledge that the farmer can use. So we have done some experiments already uh, with the schools, secondary schools, and we found that the kids are able, to, and these are secondary kids, are able to transmit the information. So they basically play this role 
of translating the information that comes through the digital technologies, in this case was computers in, the, in their schools, and convert it into a language that the farmer knows about it and can change. So we have to keep being innovative to try to find ways to, to resolve these challenges. And, and talking about the younger generations coming in here, um, you know, what is the, the future of the sector? What's the next frontier? How can technology and innovation in this sector help attract younger people to farming uh, rather than sort of leaving behind uh, rural lives for, for jobs in the city? Um, how, how are you overcoming this particular challenge? No, I think the opportunity is great, especially in continents like Africa or Sub-Saharan Africa, where you have a huge labor supply of young people eh, that they still they don't find the way to work in the rural sectors. And digital technologies where they are more used to, to use them eh, will help them to make it more attractive to it. This has already happened in Latin America. If you go to my country, Peru, for example, you see that most of the farming right now, large farming is happening by, by young people. They, they are the ones using the state-of-the-art technologies. I think that conversion can also happen uh, in the case of, of, of Sub-Saharan Africa. It's just a fact that we need also to create their capabilities. Uh, we need to, to train them because you want this to be sustainable. And what will be happening, yes, we can move to automation. It could be that automation will reduce uh, the, labor, the labor demand for certain skill sets that you do by hand, especially if you are working with commodities which are not labor intensive. But at the same time, it could create new jobs uh, to specialized people that knows how to handle these digital technologies. Everything which is control farming, which we have a lot of control farming in Africa, horizontal farming, requires digital skills because you are working with precision. So that requires digital skills. And that's a new labor demand that will be evolving over time and where the youth can play a crucial role. So I think if, if we work carefully with these technologies, uh, we could start to create a dynamism in, in the rural sector, uh, which could attract a lot of youth and could reduce this excess of labor supply that we have right now. And do you then have a, a call to action on how the global development community in particular should respond to the opportunities and the challenges that we've that we've discussed today, um, and and really how to harness this innovation that we're seeing as you've uh, characterized in the agricultural sector. No, I think that the development community, the IFIs, and and the governments have to focus enormously on expanding the broadband to rural areas. That that's a, a clear target. Uh, initially, it could be that you need su substantial support and, and, and to be able to do it from governments. But if these markets activate, then the demand will be significant that will make it even profitable to be able to do it. One, one simple example, if you recall 15 years ago, 20 years ago, when cellular started, cellular phones were only entering the cities. They were not entering rural areas. Look at the transformation that we have right now. The penetration in rural areas is very high. They use a lot more prepaid, so they pay more than the urban citizens. Uh, so they are cross subsidizing in a certain way, the urban citizens. And that's because the demand they start to grow. But to be able to make these private sector companies to enter initially, there was some work that the governments had to do, de risking or providing information of the potential demand. So there are public goods that the government has to implement to attract the expansion of broadband. And, and the Broadband Commission is working on that. We are part of that in trying to create universal uh, access to, to, to this type of technologies because the benefits could be important. But we cannot forget that this is not a panacea. So, so this is a mean that allows you to scale up something very cost effectively. But if the content is not the correct, then you're wasting your money and that will be a problem. And perhaps finally, Maximo, um, a few words in the context of our conversation on agriculture today. Um, a few words on what tech for tomorrow means for you. Tech for tomorrow for me means to be able to, to allow small farmers uh, to be part of it and to be able to, to use their resources in the most efficient way. So as I said at the beginning, if someone needs to do precision farming are smallholders because they don't have access to credit, they have limited amount of resources and they have to use the resources in the most efficient way. And yes, these technologies could help to bring more information to them, reduce their asymmetry of information, and in some cases, even to eliminate some market failures. 
because it will get closer the consumer to the producer. So I think there is a huge opportunity, but there are risks. Risk of exclusion and increasing inequalities, risk of bad quality of content that could affect and give them the negative results instead of the positive results, and risk of uh, illiter illiteracy that we need to resolve. And that's why we need to work comprehensively in a plan that will help them to achieve these goals. Maximo Torero, FAO Chief Economist, thanks so much for, for joining us today. Really appreciate your time. A pleasure. Very nice talking to you. And to find out more about how technology is being used to make progress on the Sustainable Development Goals, check out our Tech for Tomorrow series produced by DevEx and sponsored by KPMG.